So good afternoon and welcome everyone to the second of LHC's Architect Designs webinar series. My name is Shona Snow. If we haven't met before, I am the Head of Procurement for London and Southeast Region. And I'm part of an amazing team made up of client support managers, technical support and research support officers based out of our Uxbridge office. LHC is a .gov and a provider of public sector frameworks specialising in the construction arena. So this webinar is all about showcasing the talent on our architect and design services framework. And you might have heard of the award winning ADS framework, award winning and also shortlisted for a further two awards, including the LGC awards. So this is all due to the innovative approach we took in procuring the framework specifically to tap into new and emerging talent. We wanted a range of diverse architects who represent the diversity of our London communities to support our clients in achieving new and inclusive design for public buildings and spaces that are fit for purpose, given the current challenges that we face. So without further ado, I'm going to hand, hand over to our host for this afternoon, Sam Whiting, our technical officer and ADS lead. Thanks Shona, good afternoon everyone. Uh, thanks for making it today's webinar. Um, as Shona mentioned, we're showcasing some of the works by our architects on our commercial, industrial and conservation heritage lot today, which is lot four and five. Um, in our last webinar, we showcased some of our architects on public realm and conservation heritage lots, who gave some very inspiring presentations on their work. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing what I'm sure will be some exceptional presentations from the architects today. Just as a quick introduction to myself, I come from an architecture background studying and working in practice before joining LHC and having the privilege on working on the ADS framework. Many of the architects on this framework I would have been inspired by and referenced in both my studies and professional career, which is why I was very pleased to have the practices that we do on the framework, as well as the fact that we have such an eclectic mix in terms of the small emergency practices and the larger, more established practices in the framework. I think we're all starting to see a real shift in the public sector right now with the high caliber design we would usually expect to see in the private sector becoming ever more present in public buildings and public realm, as well as seeing smaller emerging practices being able to have the input in, its, in the sector and win work. I'm proud that the architect design services framework has con contributed to this with some exceptional designs being put forward to planning from the architects through the framework already with award recognition for some of these also. We've already seen 39 awards made to architects throughout the framework with 15 different clients in the London region accessing it so far, which we consider a success. And I've already been fortunate enough to meet many of the architects on this framework. I can honestly say that they are some of the most engaging companies we have across all of our frameworks at LHC. And I've had the privilege to see quite a lot of the work which has been undertaken by them. As mentioned, today is all about showcasing the high level of design with some of the architects on our commercial, industrial and conservation heritage lot have undertaken. So today we're going to be hearing from Corey Rounding from Inns Associates, Richard Taylor from Carla Terrell Head, Beth and Kay from Projects Office, Emma Buckley from Acne, Philip Brem from Wren Architecture and Design, Antonio Moll from Moll Architects and Ian Rudolph from Marks Barfield Architects. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Corrie to kick things off. Thank you, Sam. Hi, my name's Corrie and I'm an associate at Innes Associates. We're architects based in South London and this year actually marks the practice's 10 year anniversary. We work across a range of sectors, as you can see on screen here, education, housing, heritage, healthcare and commercial and we also work across all REBA stages. We believe we are good communicators and successful navigators of difficult sites and difficult situations. We believe that good quality design can be achieved, not through a large budget, but by careful consideration of a brief, a client, a site, and an end user. We work hard to maximize the value, social as well as commercial, of a site, and like to use tools such as landscape, good space planning and natural daylight to deliver appealing homes, spaces for living, spaces for working, etc. We also strive to promote sustainable design and the project on screen is an example of this. It's a social housing project that we're still working on with Brighton and Hove City Council, where we are proposing to cluster timber framed homes around an edible landscape. Today, the scheme is achieving a 59% betterment of the Par L building regulations. As well as working hard on our architecture, we also spend some of our time delivering CPDs. We now have CPDs on a range of topics and we would be very happy to deliver any of these to anyone listening today. 
Today, however, we are here to talk about our experience in the commercial sector. Before we dive into our case study, we thought it would be useful to briefly share some of our examples of other commercial experience. The images on screen show where we have delivered spaces for working for NHS trusts across London, refurbishing existing buildings to meet the demands of an evolving public body. We had to accommodate the functions of office and clinic, carefully finding ways for these two uses to exist harmoniously and prevent the aesthetic being too driven by one use or the other. The second example shows how a former commercial space was transformed into a space for higher education in central London, creatively converting spaces such as a car park into a new dining hall and gathering space. Although this project was completed a long time before COVID and a long time before enhanced sustainability targets were in place, reuse of our current building stock is now more important than ever as we re-examine the ways we work and aim to repurpose rather than demolish. The case study I'm now going to present today is Bayham Street, another project where we reused and creatively maximised an existing building to create over 500 square metres of new office space. Our client for the project was a successful and expanding digital design company, W12. They were clear from the beginning that they didn't want anything too corporate, no logos, and instead the focus was on creating office space that was bright and flexible to accommodate multiple patterns of working. The building we converted was a former piano warehouse. Key challenges were a lack of natural daylight and a lack of usable floor space. Opportunities included working with a historic building and having existing materials, such as the internal brickwork walls you see here, to enhance and add non-corporate character to the finished workspace. The site was located in Camden in a conservation area and was surrounded by multiple neighbors. We therefore had strict rules on the expansion and treatment of the building's external envelope. We had to be careful to maintain existing views and rights to light. The required office space was created through conversion and enlargement, as well as maintaining as much of the existing building as possible. Formation of a new basement and insertion of a new mezzanine more than doubled the available floor space. A new roof construction to the rear of the property introduced daylight and ventilation into a constrained site and glass portions to floors ensured natural lighting for the windowless spaces deeper in the plan. Thoughtful positioning and configuration of staircases and fire curtains kept the internal space as open as possible, as did clustering of service spaces around a single stair core. Different floor plan layouts were tested and shared with our client to ensure the final design would meet their needs for flexible working. The project involved a lot of digging. However, to minimise digging, we worked hard to minimise floor buildups and drew lots of details testing how this could work. In line with our aim to maximise available space and the client's aesthetic preferences, we expressed raw materials and avoided encasement of services or structure where possible. With services on show, it was important that they were carefully coordinated and aligned with the rest of our aesthetic. We spent a lot of time carrying out material tests and discussing these with our client to ensure that the finished building would be a bright, robust working space with the character of the historic building still visible. We hope you agree that this is something we achieved. The image on the left shows one of the lower level office spaces still flooded with natural daylight and the image on the right shows where carefully hidden fire curtains allowed for flexible open working space. Alongside the new spaces, the historic part of the building was completely refurbished and heritage features celebrated with new additions such as mechanical ventilation carefully coordinated to create characterful comfortable spaces to work. We maintain the same approach for the treatment of the building elevations where a light touch intervention transformed the approach at street level. We created a more welcoming proposition while respecting the aesthetic of the conservation area. We also took care to ensure the neighbours didn't lose out by improving their view and the biodiversity of the local area with a planted green roof. When revisiting the site after completion, we have been pleased to to visit a workplace filled with natural light facilitating a variety of working patterns. We believe that spaces where many of us spend the majority of our day, offices should be designed to be comfortable and aspirational spaces. Thank you.
Thanks for that, Corey, and thanks for that um, interesting presentation as well. Um, just want to say congratulations on the practice 10 year anniversary. And um, yeah, Byam Street case study as well was this very, very intelligent response to the lack of natural daylight in the floor space as well. So that was really, um, that was really great to see. Thanks mm -hmm. for that. We'll, um, we'll just be passing over now to Richard Taylor from Carla Terrell Head. Thanks, Sam. Um, um, just going to do my screen sharing. Hopefully that's all working. Um, so, hi, yeah, my name's Richard Taylor. I'm an associate at Curl Lateral Head Architecture. You can call us CLTH if that's a bit easier to say. Um, and we're on the heritage conservation lot for LHC. Um, but we also work extensively in education, housing, healthcare, um, master planning, arts, public, anything you want us to really. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about this building, which is Hornsey Library. Uh, this is located in Haringey and it's a grade two listed building. So importantly, we're looking at preserving, restoring, upgrading the building, but also more importantly about upgrading the library for the people that it serves, providing an improved library environment, one that's sort of suitable for the 21st century, responding to the needs of the community. Um, we have a manifesto at CLTH, which frames our approach. We engage with our clients and communities. We embrace the constraints of a project to form our designs. We adopt passive sustainable design. We design details that frame social moments and work closely as well with contractors on site. Um, Hornsey Library was built in 1965, actually by some local architects. And here you can see the opening by Princess Alexandra. I think as well here you can see that libraries have changed a lot since 1965. Uh, in the foreground, you've got some card indexes, um, which are obviously not used anymore, much more digital services. And that was a big part of this brief. Um, the library itself opened to much acclaim. There's a great uh, um, note in the Library Association record which praises the close cooperation at all stages between a librarian who believes his job is to get books to readers and an architect who can appreciate the complexities of that simple sounding demand. So we're really keen to engage the librarians throughout. This is sort of um, shows the bit of the context because the library really sits at a wider civic campus at the heart of Hornsey. Um, library here and located next to it, we actually have the grade two star listed Hornsey Town Hall. Interestingly, the library was almost the last hurrah for what was the then borough of Hornsey before it was amalgamated into Harringay, basically splashing their cash in a fancy new library. Um, a few photos here of the existing. Um, you kind of get the sense that it is uh, a generally light, open public spaces. You know, it's actually a fantastic space, but just a tiredness, you know, uninspired use of space. It could be a nicer place and a better used community hub, which is ultimately what libraries are, as well also with lots of leaky building fabric and damage. So our approach here was really twofold. Firstly, this 21st century library environment, really making space for expanded services, such as for families, um, and study space for a huge demand as well, improving access throughout, IT provision that goes alongside, but also upgrading and repairing the building, really reducing its carbon footprint. Um, the drawing here shows this approach. Um, so this idea of fabric first, you know, upgrading the pool or building elements, new curtain walling, insulation on the roof, integration of PVs, but also importantly, reanimating the interior and enabling a whole load of new activities improving access for everyone, but also preserving that the openness and natural light. Um, here we have our revamped main library space. Um, and hopefully you agree that it's uh, kind of, it's about accentuating and enhancing that historic open space, quite a fantastic double height space. And, you know, our interventions, they're trying to be subtle, but um, work in two ways. So a big one is this kind of new suspended lighting installation, which um, fills the double height space, but also um, brings lighting levels correctly. Uh, a less good photo here, but um, also flexibility for events is hugely important as a string quartet playing at the opening, um, but being able to host things like author events um, was really important to librarians, so being able to build that in into the design. Um, also, though, not forgetting just the simple pleasure of reading in a beautiful space, thinking about our social detail manifesto point here, you know, the light, the comfort that you have, but also this kind of idea that libraries are louder places now, somewhere you can kind of watch activities happen, feel part of the community, but always having somewhere to go for quiet. Another key aspect was about enhancing the spaces for children and families. Um, and it was a really good opportunity to inject some joy. Uh, you now enter the children's library through this new illuminated arch. Um, the kids really love it, it's quite exciting. And then when you go in, dot, dot, dot. 
uh, yeah, it's a, just a, a new colourful space, but still trying to work with vibrancy with the um, and respect the listed building fabric. So trying to be subtle and integrate our interventions. So this bench seating that runs alongside is new, formed in plywood, also houses radiators um, and forms kind of yeah, comfortable seating alongside the window line. Um, the retrofit work that we did as well extended from the building to the book stacks themselves. We were really keen to reuse as much as possible. And the original book stacks are very characterful, but very badly damaged. So it's a bit of a labour of love to kind of go through and find the right back panels and D stands and shelf ends and pelmets and construct something um, that still has that fresh new feeling. Um, a couple of spaces I don't have a photo of, but um, one, one that we're really pleased with is uh, this new extension to the children's library, which actually forms an immersive space. The whole um, projectors and blinds drop all the way down and you have floor to ceiling projections on the floor as well to kind of make a space which works as a reading room and can also do double function. Also up here, we have a, uh, a silent cinema. Um, again, a similar thing where you have a projector and a set of Bluetooth earphones that are uh, given to the public so you can watch films whilst tapping in the library. Just, yeah, the idea of a rich mix of activities which um, kind of has a new community offer. Uh, importantly as well, sustainability. Um, we worked really hard to improve this. Um, the curtain walling was replaced with a new high efficiency system, which was a real challenge in a listed building, um, but we worked really hard for the curtain walling manufacturer to do so. And we managed to actually get a 49% improvement on the existing building's carbon emissions, which we're very pleased with. Um, considering its listed constraints. A couple of cheeky slides about um, other projects. Um, this is Whitehall Museum in Sutton, a grade two star listed one. This was an old Tudor house and similar to the library, you know, but about providing a modern museum environment, uh, facilitating access. You can see some charred timber extensions, uh, which kind of flank the building uh, and enable access throughout. Um, also, just to mention that um, we really like to work with models in helping you understand the space and really clearly explaining it. This is St Michael's Church in Highgate, um, which really interestingly houses the remains of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, this little blue thing. Uh, uh, so we were looking here at options of how to better access the remains, which are currently in some sort of brick oven. Um, that's it for me. Thanks a lot, a bit rushed. Thanks for that, Richard. That was, uh, that was very informative, um, especially with Hornsey Library as well. I think you could really see such a sensitive design response, um, especially when you showed the curtain ruling as well. Also, I really love that exploded line drawing as well. I think they always have a special place in my heart for me. Um, <laughs> now, moving forward to Bethan Kay from Projects Office. Hello, thanks, Sam. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, hopefully that's working. Uh, so hello, I'm Bethan Kay, co-founder co of Projects Office. Uh, we're a growing young practice based in Dalston, um, and we've got a body of work in the commercial hospitality uh, and also community sectors. Um, at the top left there, you see some of our work around design for good mental health, and that's CAMS unit uh, for the NHS in Edinburgh. The first project I'm going to talk about today is Ealing Works, which was a proposal for a co-working space and artist studios um, in St James's House, which you can see here, uh, which is at the western end of Ealing Broadway. And we were appointed by Ealing Council following uh, an invited competition to work on the scheme. Uh, the building itself uh, was owned by the Housing Association Catalyst who as part of their social housing agenda had offered the building to be used rent-free uh, for a period of up to five years. And the development of the project was part funded by um, a GLA grant and Ealing Council. And as you can see, the space itself was fairly low value office space in need of some modernization. Prior to our involvement in the project, the dialogue with potential users had already been going on for over three years. Uh, and there was this growing sense from the community of disillusionment and consultation fatigue um, so to address this, we kicked off the next phase with some manifesto workshops uh, to establish a co-created document uh, to encapsulate the aims of the project. And this tried to go beyond just the normal physical requirements of the space to really get to um, the ethos that was at the heart of the hub. Uh, the space itself needed to appeal to a diverse range of unit users from recent graduates to micro businesses, artists and makers. Uh, and to try and make sure that we were speaking to as broad a range of potential users as possible, including those that might not normally uh, attend consultation events, might be intimidated or frustrated by them, 
um, we set up a series of free to attend workshops delivered by industry professionals. And these were a great opportunity to collect more data, but also to expand the network of potential users. Uh, branding was another critical aspect of the scheme, and we worked alongside graphic design company Hawaii to develop an easily recognisable brand that could be applied across both the physical space uh, and also in the workspaces digital and marketing presence. And here you can see a logo that was developed uh, along with a lexicon of shapes that formed part of that brand identity. Uh, and then below, um, you can see that applied to the development of some website slides. Uh, and to the right, a series of window vinyls that were proposed to identify the space on the street. Because we knew that the timeline for the scheme was limited and there was this five year cut off point when Catalyst would require the building back, the project was developed to allow this to act as a prototype scheme, um, which could establish a brand, but then could also potentially be moved or expanded to other locations at a later date. And to facilitate this, we developed a kit of parts approach. So we focused on light touches and smaller scale modular elements of furniture. So some examples of this on the previous page, we had the host station. Uh, here at the top right, we have the event space, which is made up of smaller elements, including lockers, uh, curtains, modular polycarbonate screens, so all designed to be easily demountable. Uh, and at the bottom are some benches, which were designed using simple flat pack uh, te fabrication techniques. The second floor focused on artist and maker studios, and here we developed a modular partition using um, standard industrial metal mesh panels and doors, uh, timber stud and polycarbonate. And these screens were designed to afford a level of privacy between the units, um, but to be more porous and open to the centre of the space to create a kind of collaborative atmosphere. Um, and these partitions are also carefully designed to fit standard product sizes so they, so they could be demounted and reused with minimal waste when they were moved at a future date. And here's a visual of that first floor space. And then unfortunately, this is where that project ends. Um, so it's just a bit of a cautionary tale at this point. Uh, the project didn't progress beyond this point due to um, issues finding an operator to, to run the space. Um, initially, the council had intended to set up a kick with the local bid uh, and run the space, but that fell apart when the bid pulled out. Um, and then due to the business rates applicable on the building, which unfortunately the council were unable to waive, um, the uh, operators, it was untenable, unviable for them to, to take the tenancy of the space and, and make a profit. So it's just a, a note of caution, really, that it's so important to have a robust um, operation plan from the outset of, of this kind of project. The next project I'm going to talk about is a completed project. Um, so it's a series of office fit outs that we've done for uh, tech company Accurex. Um, and they're a company who build communication platforms for the NHS, which connect patients and healthcare teams. Uh, when we first started working with Accurex back in 2019, they were a small team of about 20 people. Um, they're occupying a leaky basement office in Clerkenwell. Uh, they just secured their first round of funding, very exciting, and they were looking to move into a space they could grow into uh, and which would reflect their brand identity. Um, because the core of the company's work is based around effective communication, they wanted to make this a priority in their new home. Um, and so unusually and fortunately, we were able to dedicate uh, half of the available floor space to breakout zones. Um, so a large modular table, bleacher seating, meeting booths, that kind of thing, formed the heart of the space, um, facilitating whole company events, informal meetings, and even games. Actually, one of the end tables there can be reconfigured um, into a ping pong table quite easily. Um, to bring through the company's brand, uh, we also designed a bespoke pattern curtain. So the graphics here were abstracted from obsolete medical instruments and tools. Uh, which reflected the company's primary market. Uh, and this curtain became a really iconic and much loved element in the space. And uh, it's still used as a backdrop, backdrop for all the staff photos, which we're, we're pleased about. Um, and food and dining together is also a core cool part of the company ethos. One of the founders was actually a finalist on MasterChef uh, and his love of cooking has been carried through into the office environment uh, where members of staff would take it in turns to cook food um, and these daily meals became a real um, leveller in the office and an opportunity for people who might not normally uh, sit next to each other or work together to have um, more informal conversations. Following the next round of funding, which was in 2021, we were re-employed uh, to help create their new office space in Shoreditch. 
So having at this point grown to a company of nearly 200 employees and still expanding rapidly, the company has taken on a series of buildings connected by this kind of amazing um, warehouse space in the middle. So we've just completed the first uh, phase of this campus, which focused on the office building on Curtin Road. And again, breakout space and communal dining is really at the core of that scheme. Um, although with nearly 200 people now employed, thankfully it's uh, the food is prepared by a professional chef rather than, um, rather than down to the employees. Um, and again, a series of uh, collaborative tables, meeting booths, phone booths, allow for effective communication amongst the teams and also gradients of privacy in, in what is quite an open plan working space. Uh, following this, we'll be working on the next phase of the project. So the Worship Street building uh, and the warehouse um, starting at the end of this summer. Thank you. Thank you, Bethan. Um, really enjoyed hearing particularly about the, uh, the Ealing works and how you overcame the consultation fatigue. It's so common um, with the innovative workshops you showed. That was, uh, yeah, that was very interesting. Um, so now we'll be passing over to Emma Buckley from ACME. Thank you, Sam. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen and I'll get started. So thank you for inviting us to be part of this webinar. My name is Emma Buckley from ACME. Uh, we're on lot four, which is commercial and industrial, the ADSL framework. And I thought I'd introduce a range of our experience to do with commercial and industrial, particularly focused in our work in London. We are an international practice. Uh, we started in 2018, oh, sorry, 2008. So this is actually our 15th birthday. We've just had it. Our main office is in London. We've also got an office in Berlin, but we work with a full range of diverse uh, people from all over the world. And we pride ourselves in having a diverse uh, workforce. And we think that's a real strength in terms of producing design work. Uh, we enjoy working cross typologies from master plan to building to interiors. Uh, that benefits us in that we can bring a strong mixed skill set to clients often we start with a master plan there might be a few plots that end up building work and if we do do a building we sometimes uh, enjoy doing the interiors to wrap that inside and continue the same uh, conceptual ideas inside how we work we work with options uh, we believe options is the best way to find out what exactly a client needs uh, we use digital design to continuously evolve the design and we also are a big strong believer of knowledge transfer so something that we might apply to a project in Australia, we can bring that knowledge to Germany or the UK, and there's a lot of cross-transfer knowledge. We are committed to sustainable design. Since 2019, we uh, produce an annual carbon audit, both for our office and projects. Projects is the big challenge. How do we reduce carbon within our design? Uh, more and more, we're trying to do timber projects. Retrofit is obviously the, the best way forward. Uh, an example of a timber project is Elephant Park, which has just been in uh, planning submitted. We're working with Lendlease. It's a big office building in Southwark, adjacent to the new Elephant Park. Here we're looking at how to make a workplace for healthy for COVID, post-COVID life, lots of open terraces, breakout spaces, healthy uh, green links. So encouraging uh, that greenery to come inside the building and up onto the facade. Uh, also, we're having an active ground floor, which is really the way forward in terms of office and commercial use. Uh, so here we've got uh, F&B on the ground floor. There will also be affordable workplaces on some of the levels. Uh, and again, that materiality from the outside bringing it in. So it's really about making offices a more welcoming place to be. And what is the workplace of the future? That has been a key question of this particular project. And it's been a pleasure to work with Emily's on this one, uh, who are really pushing forward the carbon agenda and being sustainable buildings to London. Uh, another plot is in Brent Cross, a little bit further north London. Uh, we're working with Argent Related on a, a large scale office building here. Again, it's mixed use on the ground floor with a food and beverage focus. Uh, so this is quite an interesting building in that we're looking at what can we do for timber construction in London, really trying to push the limits because that is the big way forward in terms of sustainable design. Uh, and we have a client who's very much committed to that. So we're working in collaboration with our full multidisciplinary team of specialists to see what's possible there and pushing the agenda. Also bringing that timber materiality into the building, open cores, big part of our uh, design strategy for internal office spaces uh, to allow cross conversations, just to make it a more welcoming place to work. 
Another building I thought I'd talk to you about is Reve, who are the equivalent of Sainsbury's in Germany. They asked us to look at their supermarket brands and how we can do a new prototype. They're already quite green focused, but they wanted to, uh, I guess, take it to the next level. So this prototype supermarket actually has an aquaponic farm on the first floor. And we've been working with them since 2016 to develop a new identity for their brand. Uh, this timber modular structure became uh, the way forward. The yeah, exciting thing about this design is that can be uh, used in any type of typology. Uh, it can be configured modular, quite very fast construction periods, and it's quite affordable to erect. So this is the first prototype uh, in Wiesbaden, uh, which is very well received. It's opened last year. And what's special about this supermarket is that they're focused on local produce. So as well as the aquaponic farm, uh, growing basil on the first floor, there's also um, a local produce within the supermarket. Another timber pavilion that we built back in London that opened last year is Stratford Pavilion. This is a uh, above a DLR train, and that's why the challenge uh, of the weight and using timber, actually timber got into the conversation because of the weight, weight constraints, uh, but obviously it's also got huge uh, environmental benefits and it also allowed us to have a minimum fit out interior because the timber is celebrated both inside and outside the building uh, and we found that this has been really well received it's currently up for quite a lot of words including low carbon building of the year with construction news uh, for 2022. Nearby in London Algate we're working on a complex site uh, which we've been working sort of for the last 10 years or so three buildings the middle building is a hotel which has just been opened on the left is the residential building and on the right is an office block. Uh, so it's been an interesting uh, area to work. There's a lot of complex transport issues such as the tube, but also bus uh, line that's going through the site. Uh, this was an existing office building, which we transformed into a hotel. On the yellow, you can see the new build elements. And we also wrapped the facade of the existing building in one unified uh, new facade to give it a new identity. Uh, and we, for this building, we also did the interior work. So we're celebrating the what the elements of the existing building, but also bringing in uh, hints of the history of Algate with in terms of uh, materiality into the interior spaces too. And that opened just very late last year. And 60 Algate is the adjacent office building, which we uh, have just got planning granted for. Uh, this building again, made us look at how workplaces will be in the future and what's the best way forward. And again, we're having the theme of open terraces on the upper floors, active ground floor. Uh, it's a complex site, so we're dealing with transport and the underground underneath. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Emma. That was, uh, that was very good. And uh, congratulations on ACME's 15th anniversary as well. That's, uh, that's two in one webinar. Um, I think Elephant Park and Stratford Pavilion really stood out to me as well. The, these unconventional forms that celebrate the materiality of the design, they, and they still manage to work with the site as well. I love designs like that. Um, okay, we're now going over to Philip Wren from Wren Architecture and Design. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you for inviting me to take part in this um, presentation. I'm Philip Wren. Uh, Wren Architecture and Design is our company. We were founded in 2009. Um, the directors of over 30 years experience of um, essentially what we now call retrofit, used to be called um, uh, rehabilitation or refurbishment. Um, and we specialize uh, in um, rethinking the high street and rethinking the buildings that were built for the high street in the late 20th century that are now uh, ending the, uh, nearing the end of their useful life. Um, and retrofit is very much part of our approach, not only because of its, its obvious advantages in terms of um, uh, carbon um, footprint, but also because uh, existing buildings form part of the, the fabric of, of the, the social fabric of the town center. And um, often uh, removing them does more damage um, than it does uh, good. Um, and also, it's a lot quicker to deliver. So uh, the building you see in the background there is actually Bol uh, Marketplace Bolton, which was an existing um, ma uh, market hall. We <coughs> that had been converted into a shopping centre in the early noughties. We opened up uh, some vaults in the basement. Uh, the building's grade two listed 1851. Um, so we worked closely with our conservation specialists um, in developing this. But today I'm going to talk to you about uh, 
uh, well, the story is really about a, a company with a vision um, very much related to regeneration of town centres. Uh, the building's in Catford, uh, it's called Catford News, and uh, it's located in the Catford Shopping Centre in Lewisham. Um, it was classic 1960s, 1970s um, uh, pre urban precinct um, that has now um, become very much run down, um, dominated by value retail, um, a lot of vacancies and um, a lot of social problems associated with it. <coughs> Our client uh, is a client called the Really Local Group, and uh, this is actually the first building and the first project that we did with them. Um, and uh, they, their vision is very much of um, bringing uh, social um, um, behavior, social uses back into the town centre. Um, we have uh, the, the 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 focus of the schemes are always um, cinema, so it's about bringing cinema into local local communities um, about pro programming that cinema so that it's relevant to those communities, but also using the cinema as an anchor for other activities, which you'll see later on. The, um, they, weren't very, they were approached by the Catford Regeneration Partnership uh, back in 2018 to um, look at how they could uh, transform the existing pound land in the shopping centre. Um, the lease was coming to an end and um, the council was anxious to bring in new social and, and the community focused uses as part of the regeneration of, uh, and their vision for the regeneration of Catford Town Centre, which is an ongoing um, process uh, subject to a master plan by others. But we were approached. Um, so, so essentially, uh, what, what I'm just going to illustrate is a, a little bit of the process. This is part of our feasibility um, study process where we're looking at how um, the building can fit within the envelope itself and looking at expanding the program and developing a program in consultation with uh, the local community and that's very much part of really locals approach to um, any location they, 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 they go into. Um, it really local is part of the brand and really local is part of their delivery and this is one of the workshops that we held with local uh, community in what was then the shell of uh, the old pound land at the back, um, where we were looking, we were looking for um, how communities can be, become owners of activities and owners of the spaces um, within which uh, we're working. This is the plan that we developed. Um, the, the, the original building was actually, it had been an old market um, hall back in the 1960s, 1970s, and it was called Catford Mews, which is where we got the brand, and it used to connect uh, the shopping centre on the left-hand side with Holbeach Road on the, on the right-hand side. And then the space at the top there, the, the yellow space where we put the cinemas, that is the old stock room where we had a little bit more height and therefore was more suitable for uh, locating the cinemas. Um, the key things that we, other uses that we brought into the uh, into the program were on the on the left hand side a food hall, in the centre is the bar, what I guess what would normally call um, the foyer, but it's more than a foyer. And on the right hand side, at that point, we were looking at putting in um, recording studios, um, individual booths, recording studios. Uh, unfortunately, that that um, didn't materialise, but we're now in the process of converting that space into a a venue for um, comedy and um, small concerts and, and local events. One of the joys of working with the existing building is, is finding out what, what's, what's behind all the fit out. So when we stripped out the, uh, the pound land, we discovered this, um, this building um, the, and, and the, the, the dominant um, feature we, we uh, discovered there was this coffered slab, um, which supports the roof above. Uh, and became very much part of our um, thinking in terms of, of, of the style of the interior. <clears throat> and also um, using the existing fabric is more efficient in terms of uh, cost, more efficient in terms of time, and obviously uh, more efficient in terms of carbon footprint. Um, so so these, these, these surfaces that we uncovered became very much part of the design as it evolved. <coughs> During the course of the um, construction works, the front shutters were shut 
And uh, the client was, one, was fairly alarmed one day to find, come along and find out that some local graffiti artists had um, actually decorated the, uh, the shutters um, and was um, expressing some anxiety about um, what that would mean in terms of um, or how that would be perceived. But we managed to persuade them that actually uh, the quality of the artwork was rather um, charming and, and good and, and uh, contributed to the sense of place and sense of identity, as well as celebrating the work of some local artists. So we've we managed to, to keep that um, feature. So these are some images of the completed project. Um, this is looking through from the food hall into the central bar where we're celebrating materials, we've simply place the graphics over the uh, the different um, surfaces um, as, a, as a kind of layer. Um, this is the, the bar space, the central um, the circle in the middle, that's the old terrazzo of um, the original market hall that, went, um, that was in the place. And then we've opened up the windows in the background there to bring daylight uh, into, the, into the space, exposed services, very much part of the character of, of, the, of the building as well as being cost-effective way of of, um, of, 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 of delivering those. Um, and then the cinemas themselves, here you can see, um, this is screen one. Um, you can see the coffered slab above, which we managed to, to, to retain. Um, the, the seats were actually recycled from a, from a view cinema. They were, they were throwing them out and we managed to get hold of them. They're in perfectly good condition, um, as well as saving a lot of money. Um, this is the, an image of the, the bar. Uh, this was actually the opening evening where we had um, local DJs uh, coming along and a, and a local rap artist. Um, but it's still very, it's very much, you know, these are the kind of events that, that they host in the bar in the evening. So you can come out of the cinema in, into, into a completely different um, experience, but at least you're, you're, it, it, it gives you something other than the high street simply to walk out. You know, people hang around, talk about the films. Um, these, this is the food hall. Uh, four uh, kiosks were created to um, host local cooks, local chefs, um, and uh, this is very much part of the, 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 the um, identity of the space. Um, these open at around about um, 12 o'clock in the uh, 12 midday and um, close in the evening. The coffee is very much part of, um, of, of the offer as well. This opens at, at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, so, you know, the, the, the venue is actually open from uh, eight o'clock in the morning through till gone midnight. It's, uh, this is a picture of the bar. So 2020, it won the Fostering Health, uh, Healthy High Street Award. Uh, it was highly commended in the AJ Retrofit Awards. It was shortlisted in the RIVA Journal McEwen Awards. I'm just going to move on briefly now to um, the last, the most recent project that opened for really local group. This is in, in Reading. In this case, it wasn't a Poundland, it was an Argos, um, uh, an, an old Argos unit that had a large stock room on the first floor. Bottom uh, right, you can see the, the, the corner before we, we, we got hold of it. Um, one of the aspects of, of, of having a, a, a facility like this on the first floor is how do you get people up there? And the answer was really to open up the corner. Um, the, the coffee shop is, is the ground floor entry there. Uh, the signage really just pointing to the direction um, of, of, of up. Um, the, uh, the loggia basically exposes the, 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 the facility to the street below and talks to the street below. And we also opened up daylight into the space. Bottom picture is the stop room before we took hold of it. Um, top picture is shortly before our opening. Um, and uh, this, um, this is now the bar as it was completed. Um, and this happily won the AJ Retrofoot Bit Award in, um, in the, the, the leisure and uh, restaurant category uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we're now moving on to a new site in Ealing with Really Local, uh, which is due to open next month. It's going to call the, the, the Ealing Project. And in that case, it's an old um, strip club that has been converted into this kind of facility. Um, that's me finished. Thanks very much indeed for listening. And um, thank you, Sam.
Thank you for that, Philip. Um, I think also, you know, looking at Catford Views, um, you pose a really pivotal question there of how communities can become the owners of the spaces you design. So it's really fascinating to see how design evolved in that respect. And um, you said you incorporate the graffiti from, I think it was in the chat that Stacey Wing said that the, the artist was Nathan Bowen, actually, into yeah. the design to celebrate work of local art, artists, I thought was really inspiring. Yeah. But he just turned up and did that and it was great. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, that's, that's incredible. So, yeah, thank you for that, Philip. Um, and next, right. now we're on to Antonio Moll from Moll Architects. So my name is Antonio Moll. I'm director of Moll Architects. We're a young office uh, created barely two years ago. And uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce our ethos and our values of design. So we create environments for healthier people that promote social interaction and physical activity. And, and we understand social interaction in the frame of collaboration, inclusion, and diversity and physical activity as a way to promote people to move and walk through our buildings and be in connection with nature. And we want to do so with contemporary, innovative and sustainable architecture that blends architecture itself, engineering and landscape. The first project I'm gonna show you is the case study that we presented to become as part of LHC framework, which was our first success after starting the, the office. And it's the headquarters for Bank Sabadell near Barcelona. The, the bank had already built uh, in the year 2000 uh, a headquarter building, which is this J-shaped uh, office building with a glass front and uh, a big warehouse at the back that you can see in the image here below. The warehouse never really found its place in the, in the corporation and it remained empty for a number of years until the bank decided that it was time to uh, repurpose it and do something else with it. At the same time, the bank was already aware that the, the workplace was changing and we've seen this even more so after COVID. So the workplace needs to offer uh, another kind of experience to people to, to encourage them to come to work to the office and, and, and leave home. So the office wants the employees to make feel special from the very beginning, from the entrance, from, from 9 a.m. in the morning. They, they have to feel empowered and they have to feel proud of the organization they work for, and they have to feel that their work is, is meaningful in a way. Uh, here's an overview of the, of the floor plans. So what used to be a warehouse is now a landscaped area, uh, which is actually the roof of uh, an amenities floor where employees will have conference uh, center, training and, and, and lecture rooms, a gym, a medical facilities, a restaurant, a canteen, and multiple corporate rooms, all kinds of, uh, of new spaces that, uh, that the workplaces of the 21st century need to offer to, to people. Uh, a section diagram showing how all these uh, common amenities for the employees join with the office space on the left. And here's the, the new image of the, of the whole compound. So where we used to have a warehouse that was uh, obtrusive and impeding the views to the outdoors. Now we have a, an open piazza that is really the heart of, of it all. It links the entrance uh, to, the, to, the, to the complex. And um, it brings together the new office building and the, and the existing office building. Here's a, an aerial view uh, where we used to have uh, this massive volume and now it's a, it's a green space uh, offering lots of options for the employees to go up for lunch, to, to have a walk, uh, to, to gather with their colleagues uh, during their breaks. It has some slots to bring down uh, the light to the, to the amenities floors. And uh, a little bit of a comparison here, no? So uh, it used to be a narrow, play, a narrow space constrained in between walls now we've created an open space to to make the the employees uh, have long views uh, they, they can look to the horizon they can see all the greenery and the light comes through it's a it's a completely different space huh? so the the bridges that used to link the, um, the office space with the warehouse now are the gates to to nature are the gates to the new garden space and inside it's all about uh, making people feel welcome and feel warm because the new workspace is, is really our second home. And uh, the choice of materials uh, enhance these feelings. No? So with light woods, uh, bright, uh, bright interiors, so light can bounce in, in all the surfaces and the, the ambience and the atmosphere created is light and airy and it's healthy. 
um, some of the images of the of the new amenities for the employees, the conference center with the natural light from from the roof above, or the canteen space where all people can gather and comment uh, the latest uh, news in the world or the latest achievements at work, and everything connected uh, connecting the, uh, existing and uh, and new through through glass panes. Uh, Bringing the the bringing the green uh, to the to the very bottom of the of the floor plan, uh, and uh, this is the the facade. Uh, the building was designed and built during the recession time, so we needed to find uh, clever ways to give a special look to the building with uh, little means. So the aluminium expanding mesh placed in a zigzagging uh, shape uh, was trusted to do that, and. Uh, before I finish, I want to talk very briefly about 22 Bishop Faith, which is the, the project I spent personally four years before starting Small Architects and uh, highlighting the, the, the best giveaways of the project to, to the city of London. No? The, from the very beginning, we were asked to reuse as much of the previous project, uh, as, uh, as much of the basement and the foundations of the previous project as possible to reduce the carbon footprint, to reduce construction times, to reduce uh, cost. And again, it's uh, it's all about offering a new kind of workplace that offers more than, than desks and production space. So what we were placing under a green roof in the Bank Sabade headquarters now becomes uh, a city in the sky, the, what we call the urban village. So the gallery, restaurant, uh, cafes, spas, business center, all these new uses were placed in the, at the intermediate level for the employees to, to use. The, the flow plans um, have to change in some way. So we need to divert from the rows of desks that remind us to the production lines of the industrial revolution and uh, our, our working spaces need to uh, be geared towards uh, different kind of layouts that promote uh, uh, people to be be able to meet, to, to discuss, uh, to make people find joy in coming to work and coming to the office, fostering uh, uh, exchange of ideas and collaboration. And ultimately, it's not only for the employees of these buildings that uh, we need to cater for. In 22 Bishop's Gate, uh, we, we, from the very beginning, we wanted to offer something else to the city as well. So the, the lobby was, uh, was planned as a public lobby where everyone can come in and uh, observe art, works of art. And this is a space where art will, will change over time. Uh, every five to six months, the exhibition will change and everyone can walk through and have a look at it. And uh, at the top floors, uh, of the building will play the, there's a viewing gallery. So visitors to London will be able to go up and enjoy views of, of this kind. And that's all from my side. My side. Thanks for that, Antonio. I think, you know, hearing about your practice ethos of, you know, the fact that you're trying to deliver the welcoming design, uh, you're placing workers' well-being at the heart of the scheme, where they actually feel proud to go into work. I think that's a really commendable approach. Um, and you can see evidence of that in all of your design as well. I mean, especially with the high resolution of design and the lobbies and exterior spaces as well. So thanks, thanks for that, Antonia. Um, we're now going to be moving on to last but not least, Ian Rudolph from Mark Barfield Architects. Hello, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, I'm Ian Rudolph, a director of Mark's Barfield Architects. We're a practice that's been going for 32 years. Um, I've been with the practice for 14 of those years. Um, Mark Sparfield has a variety of uh, experience across many sectors, including workplace, education, leisure, cultural and infrastructure. We are problem solvers, creating unique responses to the site and brief. Uh, we were shortlisted recently for the Sterling Prize in 2021 for the New Cambridge Mosque, a low carbon uh, timber frame uh, building. We're on lot four and seven for the ADS framework. Today, I will talk about two different commercial sector projects, 82 Baker Street, retain and remodel. The client was the Lazari Investments uh, with an incumbent tenant ready to renew the lease. We achieved planning in the city of Westminster for an increase in office space to create 75,000 square foot 
uh, an office roof terrace plus a uh, private muse house. The tenant wanted to stop working in silos, have space that is well connected, social and healthy. Two existing 1908 and 1930s buildings were substantially remodeled while keeping shops on the ground floor open for business during the 18 months construction. You can see the, the shops in the, in the image. Um, restoring buildings to their formal glory, a good advocate on how to respond to the climate emergency and answer the question, why build new? The diagram on the left shows the internal cut and carve of the project. The site is flanked by two residential buildings shown in dark gray. Load-bearing walls were removed, um, the new structure shown in red. The population densified and WC cores increased in size and they are repositioned, shown in yellow. Load-bearing brick walls were removed. The office floor wraps around an existing service yard to create uh, a new atrium. The diagram on the right shows how the plant was positioned to one side to create new roof terraces for outside working with biodiverse green roofs, new roof lights and PVs and solar panels. Our conservation experience was also used. The project included stone restoration, careful measured drawings were required to replace damaged Portland stone elements. Internal improvements were creating an office with health, health and well-being at its heart, which resulted in key internal improvements. On the left bottom, uh, you can see the light wells opening up ground floor reception to the lower ground and improving the quality of workspace in the lower ground. The challenge was to remove significant structure, as you can see in the top left, to discreetly hide fire curtains. Natural finishes are used throughout to create biophilic design response. And on the right, you can see that quirky existing floor levels, the black and white is the existing, um, were uh, levels were, were turned into positive transitions between spaces rather than a problem. The atrium, uh, these are external views, central to the office lighting uh, and connectivity strategy is the new atrium. The before image in black and white on the left shows a service yard with fire escape stairs, one wall in glazed brick. With a fabric first approach, we reinstated the glazed white bricks uh, with thermal installation. Neighboring residents and office workers demanded privacy, which um, created a, a sort of stepping back of the facade and um, glass with a fabric layer, which we introduced. Uh, this appears like a cascade as the atrium steps back to respect neighbours' daylight and rights of light constraints. Below the atrium is a new cycle park at the base of the courtyard, and the BIM modelling allowed detailed coordination of all drainage, lighting, steel and glass connections during technical design. Inside the atrium creates a light well and glass stair connects the floors, allowing chance social interaction. Solar shading is integrated with the interstitial pleated fabric within the glass, a nod perhaps to the landlord's rag trade history. We devise low maintenance, passive solar shading and privacy solutions without affecting daylight. Workshops and sample review process and the mock-ups are essential in the technical design stages and construction. An example is shown here of how the client, contractor, and us as the architects work together closely, choosing the density of the fabric, the crimped fabric within the glass. Uh, software shading analysis happened in parallel with our environmental engineers. Gaining planning approval for a roof terrace, uh, despite being surrounded by residential buildings, was possible by introducing a biodiverse perimeter zone at the roof edge. Rationalizing roof lights, improving insulation, helped to create more space for outside working and a social zone important for the occupier. Finally, um, originally built as Marks and Spencer HQ in uh, 1908, hardly a noticeable impression is visible on the outside while renovating, restoring 
and reusing the two existing buildings, the way forward perhaps when responding to the climate emergency. I'm now going to talk about uh, the final project, the Lantern New and Reuse. This project is currently on site under construction. Uh, it was our next project with the same client, Lazari Investments in Houston. It wasn't possible to reuse the entire structure while developing more commercial space. However, we reused foundations, the basement and the ground floor slab. 33% of the existing 1960s office concrete structure was retained, saving six months on the construction program. The building size increased by 50,000 square foot. We added 17 apartments with retail on the ground floor, uh, and we turned the existing car park into a cycle hub for 330 bicycles. The total 150,000 square foot multi-tenant office space created uh, using the existing building grid. The massing um, diagrams show that at the rear we uh, on the right, we respected daylight to the neighbours by stepping the building. This stepped form allowed new roof terraces and outside working space wrapping around a new atrium. And you can see all the, the diagram on the left is how we extended the building um, higher. We were restricted by um, the view corridors, uh, so we couldn't go any higher than one additional floor. An early concept sketch shows the clear separation is created between the offices and the residential by expressing the roof terraces at the rear with double height pocket gardens on the front elevation to Hampstead Road. Every office floor has a roof terrace. The lantern corner, as we call it, uh, the location of the building um, at the top of Tottenham Court Road and the junction of Hampstead Road and Drummond Street, uh, Hampstead Road turns allowing a gentle um, bend and the building becomes visible from almost all the way down to Gooch Street, you walk past Tottenham Court Road. Uh, the planners were very keen to um, have a building that the corner could be celebrated and attract people to walk up uh, Tottenham Court Road. Do so you see the building on the left um, and then our CGI image on the right. This was a perfect location for join, expressing the joining of the two um, grids uh, of the existing building in a 3D geometric um, combining um, the public art glasswork. The building height is constrained, as I said, by the St. Paul's view corridor. So there's less plant allowance on the roof. These are early studies of how on-floor VRF and heat recovery could exist. The energy efficiency effectively drives how the facade is treated. It is key this level of technical design is brought into the early planning application design stages. Um, while maintaining views out for the office and allowing maximum daylight in, but also to minimize the solar gain, we established uh, a 60 to 40 glass to solid ratio. At every bay, air grills are positioned for the air intake and extract to avoid large centralized plant on the roof and emit ductwork, ultimately avoiding heat loss, keeping energy use down. The technical design that we carried out is key and is key on all, all these projects. Uh, we carried the concept through to construction stages using BIM and creating clear diagrams setting design parameters to allow contractors to price everything at tender. Some working progress elevations. Uh, the project is due for completion in the summer this year. Uh, on the right, this is the office elevation of Portland Stone on Hampstead Road, showing the unitized facade, and you can see the, the air grills at every three meter bay. And then on the left is the residential elevation, showing balconies um, looking towards uh, the west end. And then the roof terraces, which are nearer completion than other elements of the building, are showing outside workspaces. Rainwater from each terrace cascades down from the top to the blue roof at first floor. 
the top of the atrium is showing AOVs for the ventilation. The atrium internally becomes the internal heart of the building. Health and well-being design principles are carried through. Stairs to encourage people to climb, walk, and not use lifts. Biophilic design with timber oak panels and timber glue lamp structure uh, are expressed. And as you can see, the shot here of the atrium, work in progress, it's arriving soon at Euston. And this is the final bird's eye view of the working roof terraces and gardens, encouraging people back to work um, into the office post pandemic was key, offering more collaboration space and a chance social interaction area, collaboration in a healthier work environment. The building is now 70% pre-let with all the floors with roof terraces going first. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and uh, congratulations on the shortlist for the Sterling Prize as well. Um, I think the, what, the, the for me, what really stood out was that wonderful facade detail with the Portland Stone, as well as coming back to one of your previous projects you showed as well with that cascading stepping back the facade. I thought that was such a beautiful detail um, in the design. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, no worries at all. Thank you. So um, that's it then, everyone. That's uh, another concise, informative presentation from our architects. Um, and I just want to say a big thank you to Corey, Richard, Bethan, Emma, Philip, Antonio and Ian for their engaging and informative presentations. I hope you enjoyed them as much as I did. And just to reiterate, what you just saw were presentations from other architects on the commercial, industrial and conservation heritage lot on our architects design services framework. The framework is available for all London public sector organisations. And if you would like any information on the framework, please get in touch with myself or a member of the London and Southeast LAC team. Uh, just to say once again, thanks to those who presented for their great presentations and for all who attended today. We'll keep you informed about the date of the next webinar showcasing the extraordinary talent on the ADS framework for some of the other lots. Um, thanks all and have a good day.